Good morning and welcome to this week's View on Africa in which we'll be discussing Boko Haram and the continuing crisis in the Lake Chad Basin region. My name is Omar Mahmoud and I'm a researcher here at the Institute for Security Studies in the Peace and Security Research Program in Pretoria. And this discussion we're going to have today follows on, on a few uh, VOAs we've done. There was one back in August immediately after this uh, split of Boko Haram into two different factions. And so some of the issues we'll touch on here kind of pick up from there. And then additionally, a colleague of mine, uh, William in Dakar, did one a few weeks ago on the Multinational Joint Task Force. So we can talk a little bit about that, but I think he covered that uh, pretty well uh, then. So I'll, I'll start by talking about the security situation using some data we've been keeping up here at the uh, ISS and then touch on the security response and also the humanitarian situation as well. So I don't want to uh, rehash too much about the split that we saw back in August, but essentially just as a quick recap, uh, the Islamic State appointed a new Wali or Emir of of the uh, Wilayat Garb Afrikia, the West Africa province, in Abu Musab al barnawi reportedly a son of Boko Haram founder Muhammad Yusuf. Now, longtime Boko Haram leader Shakow didn't take too kindly like to that, and a series of back and forth messaging kind of ensued between them. And more or less, they've, they've broken away into two distinct factions. And I think this is most pertinent if you look at some of the attack patterns we've seen. So on this map here, I've plotted out the, the yellow pins are attacks that the Islamic State has claimed in their messaging since this August 2016 split. And all of these have been uh, direct engagements of security forces. So we can see kind of a core geographic area, more or less, of where uh, Barnau and his faction seems to be operating up in this northern Borno state area, uh, southern Niger. Now, Shiko, for his part, uh, one of the big reasons behind the split was this wave of indiscriminate soft targeting that often results in Muslim casualties within the region. And Shiko has been steadfast, uh, claiming that his ideology hasn't changed, that these sorts of attacks are going to be part of his profile. So the green dots, the green pins here are uh, suicide attacks that have been recorded since August 2016 that either were perpetrated by female suicide bombers or, or young bombers or uh, were directed uh, likely towards civilian soft targets as well. So keeping with Chico's more traditional attack patterns. So I think when we plot these, uh, we see also a little bit of a geographic convergence, one being along this Cameroon-Nigeria border area and then the other being, I do agree, and this also ties in uh, a bit more with uh, reports that Chico is likely in the Sambisa forest area, which is, which is closer to these, these targets. So I, I think we see a little bit of a, of a convergence, one, not only in terms of attack profile, but two, in terms of where these attacks are taking place. And I think one slightly worrying sign here is, is the rise of incidents in Maiduguri. We see uh, a bunch of pins there there have been 10 suicide incidents since October uh, targeting the city, including a triple attack this past Friday. Now, one positive sign of that, though, is a lot of these incidents have been very low impact. They've, the bombers have been stopped on the outskirts of the city, uh, killing mostly themselves or uh, just few overall casualties. So the effectiveness of this type of attack has gone down in some ways but uh, the persistent targeting and, and retargeting of my degree is a bit worrying. Now looking at overall some of the, the data we've been keeping up here at ISS, and I think it's clear that Boko Haram attacks are in, in the longer term perspective on the decline. This year through October, we've recorded 236 violent incidents, which is still a very high number, but compared to the similar period last year in 2015, there were 341 incidents, so it is a bit of a decline. And in terms of, uh, I don't often like to cite the casualty data because I think it, it's very, it's quite varied and really depends on who's reporting it, but just to give an idea, last year 
we recorded over 5,000 casualties, while this year to date uh, thus far is around 1,500. So that is that is a big difference. Nonetheless, if if we're looking at a more uh, shorter time span in terms of focused on this year, we can see that we're in a bit of a mini upswing, uh, especially since August. And this could be attributed to, to two factors, one being August was the time of this split, so perhaps the factions regrouped a little bit in the aftermath, and it also ties in with local weather patterns and, and the coming end of the rainy season in this area of the world. Uh, so. In addition, if we look specifically in terms of suicide attacks, which has been a hallmark of, of this insurgency, we see, again, a very high numbers towards the, the turn of last year and the beginning of this year. And then uh, those steadily drop for you know about six months. And a part of this was due to some security operations undertaken, especially on the Nigerian Cameroon border that were targeting safe havens and areas uh, where suicide bombers were, were supposedly being trained and held. But then again, in the past few months, we see a little bit of an upswing, um, especially again, since, since uh, starting in September. So I think this raises some pertinent questions in terms of how the group's been able to, to regroup a bit um, and, and where they're getting their materials and bombers. We've seen in the past uh, Boko Haram being highly adaptable in terms of finding territory to plan these sorts of, sorts of attacks. And, and this series of operations I mentioned earlier along the nigeria Cameroon border was aimed at rooting out uh, certain safe havens. But every time a uh, camp was destroyed, you know, further up the border, uh, new ones popped up. So they've been very resilient and adaptable at that. Uh, in terms of the materials, uh, it's, it's a little unclear, but they've uh, been good at repositioning, repurposing seized materials for the purposes of explosives before, and then also seizing them from local uh, construction sites and, and fertilizer companies and, and other things of that nature. So I think a lot of it's likely locally driven. And then looking at where they're getting the bombers again, uh, there's, there's unclear sort of um, indications of whether a lot of these bombers are forced or they are, they are willing. I, I don't think it's one or the other. There's, there's likely a combination there. But the key thing being that in its recent history over the past few years, Boko Haram's been really one of the more um, uh, sort of successful groups in this, in this realm. Uh, and so what they're doing here is just a continuation of that rather than um, uh, after after a period of, of decline. One interesting other aspect to look at is, is the location of violence. And I think we're seeing for the first time, the majority has actually occurred outside of Nigeria's borders this year in 2016. Uh, so, so that shows that this is no longer just a Nigerian problem, even if, if some still subscribe to that notion. Um, and Cameroon takes up a, a plurality of that violence. Now, I should mention the majority of this violence in Cameroon is directly along the Nigeria-Cameroon border and has been small-scale raids on villages for supplies and, and things of that nature. So casualties within Cameroon is still lower than, than what we've seen in, in Nigeria. Uh, but it's interesting to note this kind of continued spread. Now, in terms of the response, uh, again, uh, as I mentioned, my colleague uh, discussed the Multinational Joint Task Force a few weeks ago, so I won't say too much about that, uh, but they are undertaking some operations in Northern Borno State, Southern Niger, uh, Operation Gamma Aiki, which, which is Hausa for finish the job, is ongoing there. But aside from uh, the MNJTF, uh, Niger the Nigerian army has been undertaking operations on their own within within Nigeria, and there's been a big push recently uh, for Sambisa Forest, where we think Shako is hiding uh, other areas along uh, within Borno State and along the borders as well. And I think something to note is an increased use of air power to pursue these means, um, which is uh, uh, an advantage the Nigerian army clearly has and, and are using a bit more recently. So the, the effects of these security uh, operations, there's definitely been some positives. Uh, I, I think a few things to point out. 
recently there are reports that uh, up to a few hundred militants have surrendered or been surrendering in Chad. Uh, I think these numbers are augmented because uh, the militants came with their with their children and, and, and their wives. Uh, so it, it's a bit of a higher number than, than pure fighters, but some of them were complaining about the conditions that they were facing in. Uh, so it, it could show a level of success in tightening uh, a little bit around the group, uh, especially in that countering uh, Boko Haram's logistics has been a key part of, of the fight uh, under Buhari. Uh, also, we saw recently, uh, the past month, uh, the Chibok girls, 21 of them being released. I think this shows that uh, Boko Haram can negotiate about some very specific tangible things, particularly hostage negotiations. Uh, but, but the wider picture here, perhaps, is the timing of this. And while we don't know for certain what, what the parameters of the exchange were, I, I'm, I'm certain there was some sort of exchange uh, and so this could tie into Boko Haram needing either uh, funding or, or recruitment shortages. So another indication of, of the situation they could find themselves in. Now, having said this, it, it's kind of a two steps forward, one step backward situation. And I think one particular incident to point out uh, occurred last uh, October, on the 17th of October in Gashigar. And this was an incident in which militants directly engage the Nigerian army and the Nigerian army actually admitted it was forced to retreat. And in the aftermath, up to a few dozen to, to 80 soldiers were missing. Th this is kind of worrying development for a few reasons. And again, in the aftermath, uh, some soldiers complained about the, the militants having superior fire, firepower, about uh, corruption within their ranks and them not getting the supplies they need, about low morale overall. And these are really aspects that characterize the Nigerian army's battle against Boko Haram under the previous Good Luck Jonathan administration. And I, I think Buhari, uh, when he came in as president, made a real effort to improve the Nigerian army. And, and we've seen the results of that. Boko Haram is no longer holding territory like it was in 2014. But steps like this constantly uh, or consistently pop up and kind of question the overall narrative that Boko Haram's been defeated, that we're engaging in mop-up operations right now. And I, and I think it's worrying in, in some sense that uh, this was likely the, the Barnawi faction, and it shows their ability to engage and in, in directly challenge security forces and even defeat them at times. And going forward, that is, is likely a big concern, the strength of this faction in this area. So moving on, uh, just to touch on the humanitarian situation a bit, it's, it's pretty dire. Uh, any way you look at any of the statistics or the numbers, uh, up to 2.6 million displaced. We've had three straight planting seasons interrupted. Uh, you combine that with people being displaced and, and limited means of earning income, uh, and there's a real risk of, of shortages, especially in terms of food. I think UNICEF came out recently and said up to 75 children could die within the next year without adequate support. And there was an interesting study done by MSF Medicine Sans Frontier who went to two IDP camps and they measured the uh, demographics of the area and found that the under five population, so children under the age of five, up to a quarter of them were missing. So really kind of scary uh, statistics in that way. And this is tied with some major funding shortfalls um, as, as well. Uh, now, a lot of this has to do with access, which is closely intertwined with the security situation. And while this is improving in areas of southern and central Borno state, large parts of the north remain off limits and uh, up to estimates of up to 100, or sorry, 1 million people within the Lake Chad Basin region that still have not been, been uh, provided some of these humanitarian needs. So meeting these basic needs is, is a major problem and an immediate issue. Uh, it's also tied into, we, we've heard reports of corruption and aid diversion, which is not helping in, in the area. But overall, I think this is really kind of an overlooked crisis, uh, perhaps in a, in a busy time worldwide with, with uh, uh, attention on many other crises as well. Uh, in, following this kind of meeting of basic needs, reconstruction is the next sort of step.
I think Borno State in, under under Governor Shetama has, has been pushing this and, and has made some positive moves. Uh, the governor recently spent a week out of Meduguri in Bama, uh, kind of a symbolic move, but but designed to kind of kickstart this restructuring process. Uh, we've seen some schools reopening, uh, police slowly moving back in. Uh, Borno State Governor has also ordered civil authority in, in some areas to return, and in addition, a few traditional leaders have. So these are all kind of positive steps, but it's going to be a very long, slow uphill um, battle. Uh, Governor Shetam has uh, kind of stated that he would like to close these IDP camps, uh, the ones uh, in Maiduguri and elsewhere in the state, by May that by the end of May 2017. Now, I think this is more of a sort of ideal situation and a goal as opposed to uh, what we're seeing in Kenya with the Dadaab camps. Uh, you know, for example, I, I don't think it's kind of a hard deadline or, or something uh, of that nature, but more something to work towards. However, that is a pretty quick timeline, so I imagine that will be uh, adjusted going forward. And one other thing just to mention, recently a, a presidential committee on the Northeast initiative was inaugurated by President Buhari. And so they're just kind of getting off um, uh, underway right now. But generally, the, the idea is to coordinate the reconstruction phase over the next three years. So another another indication of, of moving along this front. But uh, as, as I mentioned, they're just getting started. So we'll have to see uh, how that plays out. Um, so I think we'd have to look at uh, Boko Haram's capabilities, and if you look at, especially one one indication of this is where they've been attacking, where they've been plotting out their attacks. So so far in 2016 to date, we actually have not seen an attack outside the the three northeast states under state of emergency, Borno, Yobe, and Anamama, or the bordering areas of uh, Niger, Cameroon, and uh, Chad. So I, I think. You know, you have to look at the capabilities, and I really just don't think the capabilities are there right now. That doesn't mean the the intent or the desire is not there, but throughout the duration of of the Boko Haram insurgency, even at their height, they really didn't reach Lagos. There's one sort of questionable incident uh, in which actually one of the first female suicide bombers was involved in in a, in a attack on an oil port in in Lagos. I, I think it was June 2014. But outside of that. Uh, there really hasn't been any actual operationals. Now, there's been reports of arrests of Boko Haram members. Uh, it, it's unclear exactly how many of them, you know, when you when you see these 100 people arrested in Lagos, how many of them are actually tied to the group versus being from the Northeast versus being Kanuri versus being uh, from Borno State or whatnot. Uh, so I, I really just don't see that being a threat in in uh, in the near future, especially as the armies had success kind of pinning them down within this region of the Northeast. Uh, but I wouldn't rule out any sort of desire on their part. And, you know, sometimes it doesn't take that hard to get a few guys down south. We've seen this with, with AQIM really overreaching and, and attacking Grand Bassam and Cote d'Ivoire. But it's not something I would be too, too worried about, honestly. Yeah, I think that's an interesting question, um, especially because that faction was, uh, you know, more closely aligned with Mujao in, in, in northern Mali at the time of, uh, you know, 2013 when they were taking over uh, uh, the northern half of the country. And if you trace back within Boko Haram sort of this ideological debate between Shiko and what we now see as the Barnawi faction, some of this dates back to similar dynamics we saw between Boko Haram and Ansaru. And Ansaru was always considered closer to these groups in northern Mali. And so uh, a lot of the messaging that's coming out between that, that came out between Barnawi and, and Shiko, a lot of the messaging from Barnawi's side related very closely to what Ansaru was saying around the 2012-2013 time period. So I think it, it's plausible that some of these Ansaru members that uh, potentially reintegrated with Boko Haram at some point have also led this most recent shift. And so that would indicate that there's potentially some contacts within the northern Mali area as well. Uh, but again, I, I think the uh, Al-Sahari group is, is uh, 
a bit more limited and you know they've broken away from from Belmoktar and other other um factions in, in that area so i don't know how how strong they really are despite claiming a few border incidents within uh the nigerian and burkina sorry the niger and burkina borders recently um but if you look geographically they're really not that far apart so i wouldn't be surprised if going forward there might be some connections and linkages there uh especially given the history that we've seen some Boko Haram militants going back and forth uh to northern mali uh, previously, but part of it deals with that both of these groups are kind of fringe groups that have broken away from their core entities. So that could tie them together a bit more out, out of need of support, but that also begs the question as to how much they could really be going back and forth there. So it, it's again something I, I think would be watching going forward, but given that uh, the links between Boko Haram and other Islamic State factions weren't that strong outside of uh, a little bit of movement between Libya, uh, I, I think we'd have to be a bit uh, sort of pragmatic about how deep those linkages could go as well. Yeah, so the MNJTF, the Multinational Joint Task Force, is operational. Um, it might not be what everyone was envisioning uh, when, when plans were being drawn up, but it's probably more a collection of, of the regional armies operating within their countries uh, in a coordinated manner and especially coordinating some operations along border regions. Uh, you do see the right of hot pursuit, and you do see some some cross uh, territorial incursions, but it's not a huge aspect of it. Uh, that's kind of more done on a bilateral sense. For example, between Niger and Chad, kind of having a, have an arrangement, but you don't really see Nigerian forces or Cameroonian forces coming deeply into Nigerian territory besides uh, border areas, and and that's usually pretty coordinated. Uh, so it is operational though, and in coordination cooperation has definitely improved over the past uh, year or so, and definitely under the, the, the uh, President Buhari administration, uh, which uh, prior to that relations with neighbors really weren't uh, at a good state, and that was hindering uh, in, in a lot of ways the, the development of the MNJTF. So I, I think it's, it's um, had some success, and especially we've been talking about the, the Operation Gamma Aiki uh, going on in, in northern Borno, southern Niger state, um, so which, is, which has been able to kind of uh, uh, contain a little bit the, the attacks in that area, and that was a response to this major attack that happened in June in Bosso, in which Boko Haram militants overran a, a uh, joint nigerian nigerian military post there and really took control of the town for a few days. So that operation got started a bit belatedly, but in the aftermath of that and has had some success in, in restricting, though not completely eliminating, those sorts of attacks in that region. Now, one other area where uh, there's been some multinational joint task force success is along the niger cameroonian border. And a series of joint operations there uh, earlier in the year um, were, were specifically targeting this high rate of, of suicide attacks, especially high rate in northern Cameroon. So they were targeting explosive factories, areas of safe haven, and houses where, where female suicide bombers were reportedly being held. And it was a series of operations as Boko Haram kind of shifted they, their operations, uh, their safe haven to, to a number of different areas. But it was a coordinated series of operations that kind of moved up along the border. And we saw a direct impact in that the numbers of suicide attacks went down and went down for about a period of six months until we've seen this recent spike again. Uh, so I think that was another good example of, of cooperation and coordination within this uh, MNJTF umbrella and, and a real success story. Um, but on the other hand, it shows the need to be persistent because Boko Haram is a very resilient and adaptable force. And even if they if tax are down six months later, that doesn't mean that the battle has been completely won. They, they can adjust and will adjust. Uh, going forward. So it really puts that emphasis on this sort of cooperation and coordination continuing going forward, honestly, for for a while. Uh, there, 
the tendency to kind of perhaps sit back during periods of, of, of downturn in terms of uh, violence and attacks is, is a little dangerous as opposed to keeping the pressure on, on this group. So I think the a long way to answer the MNGTF is operational and is having success, but it must maintain that and must uh, continue that going forward, especially in this coordinated, uh, cooperative way that we've seen over the past uh, few months. Uh, so this is a bit of a tough one, but I, I think we need to look at the context in when these mercenaries were in place. And so what we're talking about here is, is um, the end of the Good Luck Jonathan uh, presidency in uh, basically the beginning of 2015 when he suspended the presidential election by six weeks and proceeded to go on this sort of lightning offensive to remove Boko Haram from some areas under territorial control. Now, part of this involved the use of mercenaries, uh, many from South Africa who, who came in with um, some different sort of skills and capabilities. Uh, in particular, they've been credited for, for effective fighting uh, at night periods and, and whatnot. Um, and so there was a little bit of a lightning sort of um, take on, on pushing Boko Haram for some territory. But really, if, if you look at it, the question to use these mercenaries, in my opinion, was a political one. Jonathan was running for re-election and he wanted to, to show that he was doing something against the Boko Haram fight, something he, he's come under a lot of criticism for. Uh, ultimately, it was, it was uh, even though the, the, mil the mercenaries had success on the ground, politically it was a failure, he lost the election. And so under President Buhari, he, he kind of um, uh, did away with the mercenaries and we haven't really seen them back in that context again. Now, uh, the question about whether this was kind of the right move or not, well, Buhari had a, had a focus. He, he's from the Nigerian military. He's very proud of that force. He's, he's a military man uh, earlier in his career. He, his focus was on um, kind of uh, improving and reprofessionalizing the Nigerian army, which had fallen uh, through uh, for, for a variety of reasons and, and was no longer the effective fighting force it was. And if you're looking at a long-term strategy, the mercenaries were able to, sure, dislodge Boko Haram from some certain areas and whatnot, but they're not going to play a long-term role in terms of securing the territory, in terms of the next step there. And that's where uh, improving the Nigerian army is the sustainable and, and, and forward-going uh, solution. Um, you, you need your, your own army and your own force to be able to to kind of one remove Boko Haram from these areas, but then to continue to secure it going forward. And I think the mercenaries was just a very quick ploy to kind of make some quick gains and that's that's their use, but it's not a long-term strategy. And uh, I, I think Buhari was was uh, focused on, on building up his own internal capacities in that way. And uh, going forward, I think that's the approach you'd have to take. <laughs> 